Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. All praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. He is the first, He is the last, He is the everlasting, and He is the necessary existent. All things rely on Him, and He relies on nothing. There is no deity worthy of worship except Him. And may His peace, blessings, and mercy be upon Muhammad, who is Allah's servant, Allah's prophet, Allah's apostle, and Allah's messenger to the whole world. He was the seal of prophets, and he is a mercy to the worlds. And may Almighty God Allah extend his blessings and his salutations to Ali ibn Abi Talib and Lady Fatima al-Zahra and the Imams from their progeny, whom Allah has cleansed from impurity. May the peace of Allah be upon all who came in the great line of the vine. So we're going to continue our discussion on Surah Al-Fatiha, which is the opening chapter to the Noble Qur'an. If you haven't heard part one, please go back and listen to it. In part one, we discussed the power and the importance of Surah Al-Fatiha, and we explained the first verse, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in depth. So how often do we say, the basmala in a day, in every prayer, before eating every meal, when you open your eyes in the morning, or when you enter relations with your spouse, inshallah, and other places too. Think over that. Once you hear the basmala enough times, it's easy to look past its significance. You become desensitized to it. But in the basmala, you have the entire religion of Islam. Beginning in the name of God, it uses the name Allah which necessitates his oneness and his mastery over all things. <clears throat> when one aspires to serve God and to serve him alone, associating nothing with him, understanding that he is singular, he is matchless, he is unique and incomparable, that he has no associates and no rivals and no partners and is above the need of his creatures and all creation, is independent from all yet all depend on him. When one comes into knowledge of such a being and commits himself to worship that being and that being alone, he frees himself from the chains of this world. Your kings, your presidents, your schools, your economies, your racism, your superiority complexes, your inferiority complexes, your women, your men, all of that become powerless. You begin to recognize that their power and their authority come from an ultimate source, who is Allah, who is the cause of all causes, and once you see that, you're no longer a slave to your gut, or a slave to your wits, or a slave to your desires, or a slave to your superstructures. You are truly free. The Basmala then mentions his Rahmaniyya, which is his expansive mercy to every corner of existence. Then it mentions his Rahimiyya, which is Allah's special mercy, special love, special tenderness, and special affection to his righteous servants, those who were sent by Allah and those who came back to Allah. And we ask Allah to make us from those who come back to him. We thank Allah for sending his messenger, Muhammad, to guide us back to the path. Peace be upon him and his family. Inshallah, my intention today is to complete the chapter. The next verse in the chapter is, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And the word hamd means praise or magnification or greatness. And some of us walk as if the ground quakes underneath us. But real greatness only belongs to Allah, not the red carpet or some golden crown or a wedding dress or a world cup, no caliphate, not even a prophet or an imam. All praise is due to Allah, the, one on, the only one worthy of praise or admiration or awe or veneration. But the word hamd also means thanks. Thanks be to God. The Prophet ﷺ said, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Shukra. That praise be to God, the Lord of the worlds, 
meaning this verse, is a thanks. It's a recognition and an appreciation of his lordship and his mercy. And the believer, whenever he faces or receives something in this world, he must say Alhamdulillah because the real servant of Allah is the one who is thankful for whatever is written for him. And the Prophet would never say, if only such and such happened. He would never say that. He was earnest, beginning in the name of Allah, acting in the best manner, and accepting whatever the result of that is. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, there are four scenarios where you can be in the, the, the greatest light of Allah. And one of those scenarios is when a good thing happens to you and you say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Imam Ali ibn al Hussein alayhi salam said that whoever says Alhamdulillah has thanked Allah for every blessing. Imam al Sadiq says that if you praise Allah for any small or large blessing, you have thanked Him for all blessings. And you can read all of this in Tafsir Nur al Thaqalain. The next word is Rabb, which I believe is one of the most beautiful and most perfect names for God. It encompasses all the meanings of Lord, Cherisher, Sustainer, Nurturer, Evolver, and there are two dimensions to this word. The first is Lordship and Mastery, and all the words that refer to authority. Sometimes in Arabic you refer to the father of a house to be Rabbul Bayt, the lord of the house, because he's the head of the household. But the real head of every household and every country and every world and every galaxy and every universe and every atom and every idea and every spirit is Allah who originated the heavens and the earth. And the second dimension to the word is the nurturing dimension, the one who raises you from one stage to the next stage. The same way that a, that a mother may raise you from childhood to adolescence, Allah, who is you know, la ilaha illa huwa, there is no God except He, He was with you when you were sperm, and then clot, and then fetus, then child, then adult, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ Surely we have created mankind in the best stature. ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْفِلَ سَافِلِينَ Then we brought him down to the lowest of the low. So Allah is with us when we're full of youth and good health. And Allah is with us when we're crippled and weak. And Allah brings us into the next life just as he brought us into this one. So the word Rabb is encompassing both the majesty of Allah and his nurturing presence in our lives. And on a side note, um, look at how the Christians refer to God as Father. And Father is a beautiful name. Um, it encompasses also these two dimensions that Rabb has. But the word Father also has a biological connotation to it, and a sexual connotation. And we know that God doesn't impregnate any women in any physical way astaghfirullah god is by definition unlimited so he cannot limit himself to a certain gender allah is not the father of any man nor is he the husband of any woman and uh, we don't say father which is the word ab in arabic it's a beautiful title it's just not for god instead we replace the alif uh, in ab with a ra and we get rab and Rabb encompasses all of the qualities that we want from Ab, and it leaves behind the sexual connotation. That's not an accident. Allah clarified his attributes without taking anything away from their depth and their perfection. Then uh, we can go to the next word uh, Al Alameen, Rabb Al Alameen, the Lord of the Worlds or the Lord of the Peoples or the Lord of the realms, or the Lord of the dimensions. And what all of these have in common is that they're all created things. Imam Jafar al-Sadiq said, regarding Alhamdulillah, that it was a thanks to God, and he said that Alameen is the makhluqin, the created things. So we're seeing not just 
Tawheed in this chapter, but we also see the divine authority of God and his wilaya over all things. Rabbil Alameen. Then we have Ar Rahman Ar Rahim again, second time in the surah. And that's because Allah wants you to know who you're describing, and He wants to re emphasize that the Lord of the worlds, the nurturer of the creation, is the beneficent and the merciful. So again, we see Allah's oneness, Allah's majesty, and Allah's beauty um, repeated in this verse, just like in the Basmada. The next verse, Maliki Omuddin, the master of the day of religion. Some recitations of the Noble Quran will say the word Malik rather than the word Malik, which means king. But in the end, the meanings are pretty similar. Malik is an adjective that denotes possession or ownership or mastery. Imam al Rida said that uh, the second verse of the surah, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, asserts that God is the Malik. Well, here we are in the, th- in the third verse, and uh, we see it asserted more explicitly using the word Malik. And on a side note, in the school of Ahl al Bayt, it is makruh or disliked by Allah for one to name his or her child Malik. And this also applies to the name Khalid, which means immortal, and the name Hakim, which means wise. The wisdom here is that Allah doesn't tolerate any arrogance from his creatures. Naming your child Master may get the idea in his head that he is the master of something, when really he's not the master of anything. He doesn't even own the clothes on his back. And immortality belongs only to God. And wisdom, or hikmah, is given by God to his, cho- cho- to his uh, chosen servant. And it's not something that is given by any name that you, that you give the child. So Allah doesn't want us to use any of these. And the word yawm, you know, Malik Yawm ad the word yawm is used to mean day, but really in the Quran it means a period of time. You know, Allah created the world in six ayyam. It's not referring to six rotations of the earth. And likewise, the day of resurrection is not a 24 hour period. The narrations indicate that it's actually much longer than that. But it's one period, Yawm ad din and then ad-deen is usually translated as the religion or the lifestyle. And the Imam said, though, that the deen here means hisab, the day we will, that we will be held accountable and judged according to our beliefs and our deeds. And really, this is the moment that our lives are building up to. All of your deeds, your sins, your faith, or your lack of faith, all of it, will be analyzed and observed on this day, in this period. It's the day that even your own limbs will testify against you if you cause them to do any evil. If you punched somebody, your hand will bear witness against you. If you fornicated or committed adultery, your private part will testify against you. And although Allah is the beneficent and the merciful, He is also a shadid al-iqab, the one who punishes severely or the one who is stern in reprisal so while you're alive make the changes you need to prepare for this day treat the people the way they like to be treated and come back to Allah because one day all of us will die that's a fact live every day like it's your last because one day you're going to be right it is said that Zain al-Abidin who had a very beautiful recitation and the people would stop outside his house to just, just to listen to him praying. So it is said that when he would recite Malik Yawm al-Din he would repeat it and repeat it and keep repeating it to the point where the people thought he was going to die. And he was calling out to Allah who was the master of the law of sowing and reaping. And you could imagine the fear and distress and anxiety in the voice of a forbearing servant of Allah, the ornament of the worshippers, Zayn al-Abideen, salawat Allahi alayhi, sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. 
إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين is the next verse you alone do we worship and your aid do we seek this you can say is when the surah becomes more explicitly in the first person we're addressing Allah directly here as his worshipper and as his servant um, actually the word being used here is ibadah which is not just servitude it is the full submission of a slave to his master it is obedience or ubudiya a slave is someone who doesn't do whatever he wants or whatever she wants he does whatever the master wants notice how the worship of Allah comes in this ayah before Allah's help that's because we're created to worship him that is the more important part of this ayah so this verse delegates mastery exclusively to Allah a slave is someone who doesn't do whatever he wants or whatever she wants he does whatever the master wants and notice how in this verse um, the worship of Allah comes before Allah's help because we were created to worship him that is the more important part of the ayah so this verse delegates mastery exclusively to Allah but it's not easy to be someone's slave it's not easy to put your will aside. It's not easy to do just the will of God. So we say, وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ And we seek your aid. Because without Allah's aid, without Allah's help, without His assistance, full obedience to Him, it's impossible. Because the guidance and the zeal necessary to obey Allah comes from Him alone. SubhanAllah. Don't try to use religion to impress people. Don't use Islam as an attracting ornament like a lot of people do today. Obedience to Allah is not an extra thing in our life. It's an obligation. And He assists you in fulfilling that task. Because if you're a slave of God, you're free from the shackles of all created things. The nasta'een part means help. But in Arabic, there are many words for help. Um, this one necessitates effort you know we are seeking your aid we are pursuing your help we are after your help so his help is tied to the effort we make to seek him it's an equation you can say we worship him and he assists us in the same way that he assisted Nuh over the flood or Musa over Pharaoh or Ibrahim over the fire, or Isa over the cross, or um, the prophet over the Quraysh. And that aid, that help that we seek from Allah encompasses everything that we need from Him. And that leads nicely into the next ayah. A slave doesn't know what to do until his master guides him and advises him. So the verse says, اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Imam al-Rida alayhi salam says, اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطُ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ اِسْتِرْشَادِ دِينِهِ وَإِعْتِصَامِ بِحَبْلِهِ وَإِسْتِزَادَ فِي الْمَعْرِفَةِ لِرَبِّهِ وَلِعَظْمَتِهِ وَكِبْرِيَائِهِ In English, guide us to the straight path is guidance to his religion and grasping upon his rope an increased cognizance of the Lord and His greatness and His magnitude. So, in other words, the straight path is getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and knowing His place. Notice the three words selected in this verse. The verse was made so simple, yet it encompasses everything that we'd want from Allah. Human beings were created to surrender, ultimately they were created to worship we were not created to be hedonistic and self-centered we all eventually put our trust and our uh, our admiration in something or someone with the hope that everything will be all right in the end so the word ihdina is uh, related to the word huda and hidayah which means guidance and guidance differs than just direction 
The word hidayah means showing the way or leading to the goal in a gentle and kind way. It's related to the word hadiyah, which means gift or present. And in truth, guidance is the greatest gift that Allah has given us. The second word of the three words in this ayah is sirat. Sirat is, interestingly, a word that is not Arabic. It entered the Arabic language. Um, there were different ways of spelling the word, uh, with a sad or with a zain, and even the gender of the word is uncertain in classical Arabic. The word may actually be uh, Syriac, which is Syria, uh, Syriani, and Latin has the same word, which is uh, strata, which means street. The Quran in other places uses the word sabil, which is Arabic, and it means a way or a path or an avenue, and if you read carefully, you'll find in the Qur'an that there's only one sirat, but there are several subul. It's because these subul are pathways that lead to the ultimate sirat. Uh, it's like saying uh, several neighborhoods and smaller roads that connect to a major street, and that street represents the religion of Islam and getting closer to Allah. Uh, all the good there is in this world and in the next world is acquired through cognizance and nearness and obedience of Allah Azza wa Jal. And that's why you need to follow the straight path. Uh, there are some narrations which say that the Sirat is uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib. And that is true in a sense. Ali is uh, the gate to the city of knowledge. At the time these narrations were being reported, Ali uh, was being cursed from the pulpits. Um, it was a regular occurrence. Banu Umayya were ritually sending la'na upon the Imam from the Caliphate of Muawiyah until the Caliphate of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. So by saying that Ali was a sirat, the Imams were emphasizing that Ali was the major missing ingredient in the faith of the majority of the Muslims. And without him, alayhi salam, uh, full understanding of Islam and proper practice of its teachings was not possible. Uh, Ali is the intermediary between us and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Uh, how are you going to know how to pray and fast without an intermediary between you and the teacher? Uh, Ali has a vital role in our religion, both practically and spiritually. The Imams are trying to tell us that in order to get closer to the straight path, acceptance of the duties, the Imams are trying to tell us here that in order to get to the straight path, acceptance of the deputies of the Prophet and the representatives of Allah was a necessary step. Now that doesn't mean that Ali is the be-all and end-all because after all uh, the sirat is simply a pathway to righteousness. So Ali is not the absolute sirat nor can we say that he was always necessarily the sirat. Uh, he's simply a part of it. He's part of the sirat as were the prophets, as were all the hujaj of Allah on earth. To know the ultimate objective of the sirat, you need to go back to the hadith of Imam Rida, which says that the straight path is the religion of Allah, uh, grasping upon his rope and increased cognizance of Allah. And some narrations also say that the rope of Allah, of course, is the Qur'an, uh, while others say that the rope of Allah is the Ahlul Bayt. Um, and to reconcile the two, you say that they are both the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt. Both are the rope of Allah, the two thaqalain. Uh, they are inseparable. Uh, you know, hold on or grasp on to the rope of Allah altogether and do not be divided. So we Muslims uh, are expected to be united, holding on to the rope of Allah together. The third word is mustaqim, straight. And the fastest way to get from point A to point B on a map is to draw a straight line between the two points and that's much quicker than doing a zigzag or a curve or whatever a straight line but isn't just straight um, this isn't just straight in the geometric sense 
It is also the upright path, the conventional path, the straightforward path, the righteous path, the path that was meant for us because Allah created us with an intuition that leads back to Him. Sirat al-Mustaqim is the natural path, the expected path. It is the healthiest way for us to grow into Allah's salvation. And then a path that is unstraight, uh, in a trouble, uh, it's a troublesome path. Uh, maybe one taken by someone who is confused or impaired or lost or hurt or struggling or led the wrong way. And ultimately, we don't want any of that. We want the path that was prepared for us, the one that we were made for. We want to be guided to it. Uh, we want it to be gifted to us. We want Allah to help us recognize it. And there may be obstacles in finding the path. For the second century uh, Muslims, maybe the obstacle was finding a place for Ali ibn Abi Talib uh, into their hearts. But now that we claim to love Ali alayhi salam, uh, maybe the obstacle is different for our generation. Whatever it is, this ayah is asking for Allah's assistance to overcome those obstacles and be led to the path of God. And it's you know it's a beautiful verse. You won't find one like it in the Quran, especially in the first person like this. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. And to further support the hadith of Imam Rida. Uh, the Sirat al-Mustaqim was mentioned uh, again in the Qur'an in Surah An-Nisa, verse 175. فَأَمَّ As for those who believe in Allah and hold fast unto Him, them he will cause to enter into his mercy and grace and will guide them uh, into, unto him by a straight road. So we see how in this verse belief in Allah and holding on to him comes before obtaining of his guidance onto the straight path. And that's one of the reasons why إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ precedes إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمَ uh, also notice how it is Allah that puts us on the path. We don't find it ourselves. So when you're on guidance, it's not out of your own intellect or your effort. It's Allah that puts you there. Then we find later in Surah Al-A'raf, uh, we find Iblis talking to Allah. Now this is right after Iblis dis uh, disobeys the order of Allah to prostrate to Adam. Uh, listen to this, because this will help us understand uh, the Sirat al Mustaqim from the dimension of Wilaya. Allah selected Adam to be his vicegerent, his Khalifa on the earth. And Allah selects whomever is most fit for the task. The Khalifa is the best of creation in his God consciousness. Then Allah wards off all evil from him and purifies him from all uncleanliness and perfects his form from all defects. And that Khalifa, that Hujjah, becomes the means through which Allah is recognized and followed. So when Allah commands his angels to bow to Adam, everyone in the gathering prostrated, except Satan. Now Satan, at one point, was a pious and righteous worshiper of God. And Satan rejects uh, this order out of jealousy. He says, you, God, created me from clay, uh, uh, created him from clay, and you created me from fire. Uh, I am better than Adam. But Allah selects whomever he wills. When Talut السلام, was selected to be the king of Banu Israel, the Jews uh, were taken aback by that. And they said that Talut was not rich. We want a rich king. When Ali, peace be upon him, was uh, selected for his task, the people said that he was too young. But Allah selects whomever he wills. These are accidental factors, you know, age, shape, wealth. These aren't the criteria by which Allah causes one to inherit the kingdom. Jesus was made a prophet in the cradle. And Job was a prophet even though he had lost everything. So even though Adam was uh, of an earthly substance physically, 
the wilaya of Adam was the wilaya of Allah. So Satan rejected this, and Allah banished him from his presence. Then Shaytan, interestingly enough, asks for respite, which is a waiting period uh, before his punishment. And Allah grants it to him. Shaytan says, as related in the Quran, uh, Now because you, Allah, have sent me astray, verily I will lie in wait for them on your right path. Siratak al Mustaqim. This is very important. It says that the devil will be waiting upon the straight path to misguide the believers. You see, the main objective of the devil is to misguide the believers. He's not going to waste his time in a church or in a Hindu temple or with the Satanists or with the polytheists. His disagreement with Allah was on the subject of wilaya. And as we'll see in the next verse, wilaya plays a very key role in the meaning of sirat. Um, Shaytan said that he will await the believers on sirat al-mustaqim to misguide them. You know, he's not out misguiding the disbelievers. They've already been misguided. There's no point. He wants to misguide believers. And it means that he'll be putting all of his effort into deviating the Muslims. And Satan is very busy. He's in the mosques. He's in the false interpretations of the Quran. He's in the scholars. He's in the false interpretations of history, of eschatology, of fiqh. He's trying to mislead and confuse you with something that seems Islamic, but is actually designed to destroy Islam. Just as shaitan has forces outside of the realm of religion trying to misguide you, he has forces inside the realm of religion trying to confuse you and tarnish the image of religion from within. He has forces inside of you, inside your very nafs. He has forces outside of you, in the form of humans working for him and jinn working for him. And that's why Shaytan says, Then I shall come upon them from before them and from behind them, and from their right sides and from their left sides. He's coming at you from all angles, and he will misguide all of us into committing sins, except those whom Allah has purified. And that, my friends, is a good segue into the final verse. So now we're looking at the last verse, starting with, Sirat al ladina an'amta alayhim, the path of those whom you have favored. We have a hadith where Abu Ja'far al Baqir said, Sirat al ladina an'amta alayhim, yani Muhammadan wa dhurriyatihi salawat Allahi alayhim. The path of those whom you have favored means Muhammad and his progeny. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them. This is incredible. This is a supplication, meaning Fatiha. Uh, to guide us to the path of Muhammad and the family of Muhammad. We want to be just like them because they live their lives attached to Allah and unattached to the world. And for that they were given wisdom, courage, uh, they were made excellent in all ways possible. The Prophet was the example of the Noble Qur'an. And Allah told them to say, and he said everything as he was instructed and in this surah we want their path notice how the prophet and his ahlul bayt are described as alladhina an'amta alayhim the ones who were given ni'mah the word ni'mah means favor or blessing or grace or mercy and in surah al-maidah the word ni'mah is used to refer to the religion of Islam. You know, وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي This is in the verse on the completion and the perfection of the religion. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah mentions the word ni'mah um, in relation to the Jews three times. Uh, where Allah says, Remember my ni'mah upon you. One of those times it's referring to the covenant that Allah had with the Jews. And then the other two times, it's referring to how Allah preferred the Jews over all the other nations. And he did so by sending them prophets and by bringing them out of bondage in Egypt. But that covenant, that blessing, that preference, 
it was taken away from the children of Israel and it was given to the Prophet Muhammad and his pure immaculate Ahlul Bayt and so in Surah Al-Fatiha we're beseeching God for this ni'mah the entire surah is building up to this point this is what we've been asking for ten times every day minimum and we ask Allah that he gives it to us again so غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَلْضَالِينَ and not the path of those whom you are angry with or of those who have gone astray this is the very last part we're asking Allah in this verse to guide us to the path of the righteous and not the path of these two deviant parties or these two misguided groups المَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَلْضَالِينَ now you'll find many narrations many hadiths that specify um, like they'll give specific religions or specific sects that these two groups are referring to and I'll recite those hadiths to you then inshallah we'll get into the meaning of the words themselves and how to reconcile uh, all of this together so the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam says in Majma' al-Bayan غير المغضوب عليهم اليهود ولا الضالين النصارى so those who have incurred Allah's anger and wrath are the Jews and those who have deviated astray are the Christians Imam Abu Abdullah al-Sadiq alayhi salam says in uh, Tafsir al-Qummi المغضوب عليهم النصاب والضالين اليهود والنصارى so those who have incurred Allah's anger uh, are those who have opposed and persecuted the Ahlul Bayt or literally uh, the word Nasab also means the imposters the deceitful, the frauds, the con men the two, you know, it could be referring to those who persecuted Ahlul Bayt as well at the same time and of course the deviant in this hadith are the Christians and Jews in another hadith Imam al-Sadiq says المغضوب عليهم النصاب والضالين الشكاك الذين لا يعرفون الإمام those who uh, have incurred Allah's anger are the nawasib again but the deviant here are the doubters who do not recognize the Imam we'll explain that soon inshallah and the last hadith I'll mention is uh, from Imam Rida who says that the مغضوب عليهم are المعندين الكافرين while the dalin are الذين ضلوا عن سبيله من غير معرفة وهم يحسبون أنهم يحسنون صنعا so um, those who have incurred Allah's anger are the stubborn disbelievers while those who are deviant are those who have gone astray from God's path without knowing and they actually believe that they're doing well that they're doing good so putting this all together the word ghadab means anger and rage and those who have incurred Allah's displeasure then are people who have disobeyed him deliberately you know Allah doesn't punish those who commit mistakes he punishes those who sin deliberately so these are people who know the truth but disobey it anyway and they cover the truth from others they brush it aside they're the ones who incur Allah's anger and punishment and balal uh, means misguidance and deviation misleading straying or to make an error so the balin are those who have lost the path they aren't going from point A to point B they're going in circles they're going in zigzags they're swaggering their way around this life and there's a sense of uh, naivete in this word um, some of the dalin are musad'afin some of them don't necessarily even know they're misguided they believe the lie maybe unknowingly maybe accidentally and they kept going with that lie now of course some people uh, are proud of their ignorance and they have no intention to correct themselves ever they have no interest in fixing themselves they have no curiosity uh, to understand the creation and the creator these people wallow in their misguidance they uh, deviate further and further but some of the dalin 
have simply lost their way. You know, they've fallen and they need a hand up. And we're asking Allah in this ayah uh, to be from neither the maghdubi alayhim wa ladhalin. And so now that you understand the meanings of these words, you can try to understand how or why the ma'sumin applied these terms to specific groups. The maghdubi alayhim aren't inherently the Jews or exclusively the Jews, or only the Jews, and nor is it referring to all Jews anyway. Um, the Qur'an affirms <coughs> that some of the Jews are sincere. The Qur'an doesn't generalize or paint with one brush. It doesn't do that. But the Prophet is saying that many of the Jews fit in this category as a group and that's because, despite God's revelation to them, they disobeyed Moses. They played games with God, they tried to find loopholes in their law. They did everything they can to procrastinate their duties before Allah. So they became arrogant. They became arrogant with their covenant with God, and they attained a, cell, uh, and they attained a sense of entitlement. And so, because they know the truth and reject it, uh, with arrogance. And so because they know the truth and reject it with arrogance, Allah has cursed them in this surah. But again, not all of them. Islam is for all people. And we know that many sincere Jews and rabbis, they became Muslim. They even became followers of the holy household. So Islam is for those who love God and fear God and want to get closer and closer to the divine. But those who want to cover up his truth and do whatever they can to gain this world and its possessions, they're the recipients of Allah's wrath. And so this group can be anyone who fits into those qualities. The Nawasab of Banu Umayyah, they knew they were stealing the rights of Ahlul Bayt. They recognized that. They didn't do it naively or accidentally. It was on purpose. And so they're in this category as well. The Dalin, however, are the astray. And the Christians didn't deliberately disobey Allah, at least not most of them. And they love God, and many of them live for His service. I'm talking here of the real Christians, of course. But they got their beliefs wrong. They worshipped Jesus, whereas Jesus said, I can, by my own self, do nothing. And with that, Satan was able to sneak into their religion and have them naively worship Jesus rather than worship the one who created Jesus and sent Jesus and took Jesus back to himself. And likewise, those who don't recognize the Imam of their time are victims. They're victims of history. They're victims of the lies and the deception of Banu Umayyah and Banu Abbas. And really, you can't blame them. You're supposed to have sympathy and pity for these people. We have a duty and responsibility to protect them, and to give them their rights. But at the same time, they didn't hold on to the two weighty things. They didn't follow the Imams in prayer, or in fiqh, or in any other way. Uh, they went off the path due to political conspiracy. And because of that, they've... Uh, consequently been cut off from the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. So, you know, and Allah may choose to forgive the Dalin If they had no way of ascertaining the real belief, true belief, it's very possible Allah can forgive them. As I said, some of them are misguided victims, and in the Fatiha, we're asking Allah to not make us from among them. We are a people who are supposed to want to get closer to Allah, while the Dalin only get further and further away from the light until shaitan brings them into gross darkness. It's exactly what we don't want. And with that, we close the surah. Um, in the school of Ahlul Bayt, while we're praying, the imams told us to say, uh, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, at the end of the surah, and we say that with a quiet voice. And this is contrary to the mukhalif practice of saying, Ameen, um, which we believe did not come from the Prophet, peace be upon him, and it is therefore a bid'ah. So instead we thank Allah for the Sab al-Mathani, which are the seven special verses with a lot of depth, 
a lot of discussion necessary to explain, hence the two talks that we had on it. And so before we close, I want to say that uh, there are people out there that want to take this soda away from us, away from our lives. There are people out there who don't want us reciting the Fatiha at meals and at majalis and at the graves. They tell us that the Prophet didn't do this. But we recite the Fatiha because of its power. In part one, we mention the virtues of the Surah. And after going through the Fadla and the Tafsir of the chapter, its value and its power should be clear. And one who understands its value will want to read it everywhere he goes and at every occasion. You'd want to make it one with your being and one with your breathing because in this surah is everything we want from God. In this surah is the greatest name of Allah. And so we ask Allah in His greatest name to accept this from us, to guide us to the straight path and to keep us on it because that is the only way we'll find success in this life and the next. And with that we'll close. All that I have said that is good and right, it is from Allah. And all that I said that is wrong, it is from me. And I ask Allah to forgive my shortcomings. Bihaqi Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. Please keep me in your dua. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.